Merci, bonjour tout le monde. That's about the extent of my French, but I have a, I have, I have a few more words uh, if emergency. Uh, it's very nice to be here, and I want to uh, explain a little bit about the nature of the work we do, and then uh, present these ideas to you. Uh, there, I guess there are about 10 of us in our core group, uh, mostly in Toronto, and we mix and match on projects around the world, as you heard in the introduction. And the most important thing to know is that we work from practice to theory, not the other way around. So I think I would say accurately that 80% of the best ideas we have are coming from practice, from leading practice. So that when we team up and do something, in fact, we go, it goes like this. We team up with big chunks of the system, I'll mention some of them, and then we do change for two or three years, focusing and getting results. And then after we do it, I write a book afterwards, not before. And so we do the work, we write a book. We do better work, we write a better book. And if you live long enough, like I have, you write lots of books. So, and now they're starting to be translated by the Chagnon Foundation, thanks to Claude and others, uh, so that the two themes of today uh, are the themes of the books recently translated. One is coherence and the other is deep learning. I'll tell you about both of those. So this uh, work of uh, applied, we're trying to get at the easiest possible way to understand how to do big change, and change that makes a difference in the classroom, but also affects the system as a whole. Uh, we work, I'm, you'll see in the deep learning, I'll, I'll refer to the seven countries we work, uh, but mostly we are um, working initially in Ontario, and then California said, well, things are working, we see why it's working, please come down and help us. So the last six years, we've been working in California, a very big system, 43 million people, 1,009 districts, so that there's, uh, there's lots of opportunity to learn together and to become uh, more practical. Uh, I have a, the website you'll see in the bottom left-hand corner is michaelfullen.ca. So www.michaelfullen.ca. Uh, you can go on the website, you'll see a lot of the materials there. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, and there's a lot of resources that we've uh, developed from doing that. I am going to use the handout that you have in, in front of you, uh, more or less uh, following the order of the slides, so uh, you can do that. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about them as we go. And we'll have a QA, and a I guess, around just before 11. And I'll just give you the two questions I'm going to ask you uh, then. I'll give you the questions now. One question, the positive one, I'm going to say, what's the best idea you got from the first two hours? So what's the, what's the best idea that you think uh, you like? And then the second question is, what's the biggest question mark on your mind about how to bring about change uh, on, a, on a large scale? The minimum size we work with usually is a whole school board or district, uh, ranging from size of, uh, sometimes in California, there might be only 10 schools in a district. In Toronto, where we work, there are 583 schools in a single district. So big to small to uh, very large. So we're going to um, work through these ideas. I'm very uh, proud, actually, to have about three or four years ago teamed up with the Chagnon Foundation and with Claude to uh, see how, uh, and later on I'll refer to leadership from the middle. And I'll give you uh, the, the, uh, the more formal definition then, but let me just um, plant the seed right now. Uh, we got to leadership from the middle. You might think of it this way. Uh, you have the government level, and then the middle are the school boards and the schools, and then at the uh, community level are individual schools. So we discovered a long time ago that the top-down change doesn't work usually because the ideas aren't right, but even if they're right, they don't stay right because people, politicians change, so we can't depend on the top to get the policy right. And then people started to do uh, what they call site-based management, individual schools being um, able to lead change, and we found with that, with individual schools, that actually only a few of them changed, and it never added up. It never really went to any uh, numbers, so we said, if top-down change doesn't work and bottom-up is too slow, where's the glue? Where's, the, where's the, uh, the momentum? And we said it's in the middle. 
And uh, it's, a, it's a loose definition. Sometimes you could take, go to the school board and say the middle are the schools within the school board. So you can sh uh, shift your terms of reference. But in our case, we're thinking of the province of Quebec. We would say, that, okay, we government. Um, we have had some um, interaction with governments around the world. And generally, I would say sometimes they're good to work with. They're focused on implementation. Other times, they just seem to be political all the time, that they're not really getting to the substance of imp implementation. So we tend to then not depend on them. And I'm not uh, saying uh, that you should ignore your government, because otherwise I wouldn't be able to work in Quebec very often. Uh, but I am saying that you don't need to depend on them. You have a lot of the resources you can do here, especially when you collaborate, as, I, as I'll uh, refer to it, uh, to be able to bring about changes and still be within the context of, of uh, province policy. So that's, uh, that's the way of setting the stage. But take, if you take uh, the, uh, the kind of first slide here, and we'll just kind of set the stage. This slide I just did last week. And I said, what is, uh, what's the smallest number of things that we're learning that I could put on one slide that would cover everything? Not all the details, but all the all the issues, and this is, uh, this is uh, the, the notion of what is it going to take, because our goal is to raise the bar and close the gap for all learners. So it's, it's equity and excellence at the same time. No subgroup should be uh, working at less effectively. So I'm gonna take you through these ideas. I'm gonna show you uh, two or three videos from our deep learning work and uh, get the sense I know Many of you are doing PLCs, uh, professional learning communities. We like PLCs. We don't use the term very much. We just use collaborative cultures, focused collaborative cultures. It's the same thing, that it's when teachers work together with good leadership from other teachers or whoever the leaders are to order to accomplish more. We now have proof that you can accomplish a lot more by working together in a focused way. The proof I'll show you in, in one of the slides. So let's take the, uh, the building blocks here at the, uh, at the kind of essence. And we tried to say, you know, when we started this, people were just focusing on the learning, the literacy, numeracy. But then we realized that there's just several things that have to happen for this to be successful. One of them is uh, to have high expectations for all students. Not by itself, but it was one of the ingredients. A second one is to, uh, for teachers to have the pedagogical know-how, which is uh, what is the most engaging. And you'll see later, I'll show you how we shifted from uh, shallow learning to deep learning. Because shallow learning, not only was it not effective, it was boring for teachers and students. And so we have pedagogical know-how. And then caring relationships, obviously a big one but one that really is easy to miss. And we have some interesting concepts now where how do you establish caring relationships with students who aren't fitting in to school but still need to be connected. And then the last one is uh, life circumstances. We don't expect you to change the life circumstances of each and every student, but we do know that you have to take into account where they're coming from. Where are they in their lives? And we, where, how do we do that? Last week I was in Moncton, New Brunswick, in a school that's called TESS, which is a thera therapeutic, ex a, a couple of other names. And in it, school, uh, st students who aren't fitting into some schools go to that school for a year to get in touch with it. And the life circumstances are the, are the main driving part. So we have that as a foundation. Those are the four things. The, the question then is, if these are the four crucial things. How do you breathe life into them? I'm going to call it oxygenate. That's a real word, I think. How do you breathe, breathe life into these four things? You can, and this is where we get into the strategy. And so number one, you could say, well, an individual teacher could be that good to do this. Uh, we call that human, capa uh, human ca uh, capital. One teacher, great. But one teacher at a time is not going to do it. So we have to then see what else is going to happen. And the big thing is focus collaboration. This is what PLC does when it does it well, is that, in other words, learning from other teachers. 
in a focused, focused is very important, focused, specific, collaborative way uh, that to do the things that are at the bottom of that triangle, to interface with that. So that's the second one that has to be existing as a strategy. The third one is uh, enabling leadership. This could come from uh, teacher leaders. Certainly it comes from school leaders, school principals, and others. If there's one thing we know in these uh, second two tiers of the, of the triangle is lateral learning, learning from peers is the most powerful learning you can have if those peers are a little further down the line and they have something that you can learn from. So lateral learning, I would say, is our most powerful strategy. And then at the top are uh, targeted policies, I call them. These are policies that invest in the direction uh, of this. And when we have a system that's working quite well, uh, we work in Finland, for example, we work in Victoria, which is in Australia, where the top is trying to get those targeted policies better organized. Sometimes it's investment of money, sometimes it's the right policies, sometimes it's providing support, and sometimes it's figuring out how do you assess progress. So this is the picture that I've done recently that kind of summarizes it in one, one slide. And you can, um, you can think about it in terms of these as a checklist or a combination of things that have to happen. So let's get into uh, uh, equity. This is, uh, lots of people talk about equity and they refer to um, importance of all students learning. But we take it in a certain way, which is uh, equity is not just having a policy of equity. Equity is not just having a vision or an expectation of it. Equity is getting results. And by results, I've defined it as no subgroup should do worse than any other subgroup. I don't mean each and every individual, but I mean on the average, no subgroup. So we know, for example, in Ontario, where, where we have uh, tracked literacy uh, and uh, done something about it, that English, uh, English uh, language immigrants, where they come in at the beginning and they start way low, that within five years, we can close the gap to nothing. That is, English language learners end up learning at the level of, of students that we're, uh, we're already starting uh, in, in Ontario. We've done it because we focused on English learning, uh, language learning uh, strategies and specific things. So that's what I mean by, by this. I'm going to, um, this is the book that we did on coherence. I'm going to take you through our simple coherence framework. And we are uh, able to, I think, see uh, how coherence is so important and so elusive because it involves coherence in your mind. And we're going to be able to, um, to, to work this through. As I do, the, and just in terms of the, uh, uh, the presentation, I'll be asking you from time to time, this room is a lot of people, you're not, normally we're working in groups or at tables, so this won't work here, but I'm gonna ask you from time to time to consult with Maybe three people, like right beside you, just in subgroups, you can decide on that. So periodically I'll do that and you'll be able to get from there. So the work of coherence, this is the essence of it. Uh, we now have the book in, in French. And we have, um, what we like for big solutions is that there's a word that's not even an English word, but it's an English concept now. We call it simplexity. So simplexity is when you take something that's complex and you reduce it to the smallest number of important pieces. And that's the simple part, small number, in this case four. And then you make those pieces go together. And that's the synergy of it. That's the complex part. So we've got here, you'll see in the four, uh, the focus direction, collaborative cultures, deep learning, and uh, securing accountability. So when we have that, and this is, this is not one, two, three, four. None of, no change can happen as a cookbook. There, it's more like I would say the anal best analogy is the functioning heart. Blood is flowing in and out of all four chambers. If any one chamber is damaged, you die or you get sick. Same with organization. If any one of these is damaged, uh, you, uh, you can't function in an organization. So we do attend to all four at once, but we tend to focus on the top two to begin with. Making sure the direction is focused. Uh, usually it's about literacy. 
It's about high mathematics. It's about high school graduation. And recently, it's about deep learning, focus to get learning that will be suitable for students to be able to be good citizens, not 10 years from now, but while they're being in education, while they're being in school. So focus direction is one in collaboration. You can't have focus direction without collaborating because the focus direction will be only on paper if you're not collaborating. Collaboration is necessary to get the best ideas for the focus direction. And it's necessary for people to uh, uh, understand and believe in it. So we're gonna work our way through that. Uh, coherence, here's where I want to make sure we understand the definition. People, when they tried to bring about the change I'm talking about, used to refer to alignment. And a lot of them still do. So we have our policy. It's aligned to our professional learning communities. It's aligned to the financial investment. It's aligned to the assessment system. All of those alignments don't mean anything for one reason. They only exist on paper. And so we want to shift the emphasis here and say coherence is fully and only subjective. If you think about that, it's a, it basically says, if, you don't, if it's not in your mind, it doesn't exist. That's a powerful criterion. If it's not in your mind, it doesn't exist. Uh, so that this already tells us uh, we've got a lot of work to do, but it's much more complicated than that because what we're talking about is shared coherence. It's got to be in the minds of several people who are uh, understanding of that, uh, that way. So it's the shared depth of understanding about the nature of the work. And right away you know you can't get coherence from a lecture like this. You get a little bit. You can't get coherence from a, a big speech, by a document, uh, all of those things. Even by meeting once a month, you can't get it. It's what happens in between meetings that counts, which is the day-to-day -day culture. There's only one way to get coherence, and that is to have a daily culture that's interactive, that's focused, that goes, takes us back to the triangle. So uh, the, the strategy of, uh, I, I want to think about strategy here. And in this slide, I've said it really requires two things to be effective, the clarity of the strategy. One is the nature of the idea, and the other is the process of change. Uh, what is the, uh, that produces greater ownership and capacity. So the idea's got to be a good one. It normally has to be changed and re uh, redeveloped as it goes. But so is the interaction. I want to give you two examples. And I hope they translate well, because it's hard with some of the, uh, uh, the more insights to get the, uh, get the words right. But here's the first example from business. One of the uh, CEO of Honeywell, when he retired five years ago, he was, in, he was interviewed and he was asked the following question. They said, you've been successful over 25, 30 years. What's the most important thing you've learned about leadership, they asked him. And this is what he said. He said, the most important thing is to be right at the end of the meeting, not at the beginning of the meeting only. I hope that translates. If you're right at, this is a metaphor. If you're right at the end of the meeting, you've processed it with the group. If you're right at the beginning of the meeting, you're only right in your own mind, which doesn't, isn't much value. So that's a very important uh, way. I saw another more elaborate example. In our work in Australia, we were working in <coughs> uh, the Australian Capital Territory, which is in Canberra, 80 schools, a stagnant system. They wanted to move forward where they started to do that. And when we first went there to the high school, Canberra High School, we, uh, we went into the school that day just to see what things were like to talk to people. And teachers were doing, they had just started a peer coaching feedback system. They trained three teachers in a quality teacher framework to observe teacher and give feedback. All of the teachers that we talked to that day said, we're not going to do this. We didn't even ask them the question. They said, we're not going to do this because we don't want others coming into our classroom, observing what we're doing and telling us how to teach better. So we would definitely not do it. I'm going to call that resistance. And so they, they, uh, they said that. We came back three, day, three years later, then I'll fill in the blanks in a moment, and everybody was doing it in that school. Everybody was participating in the peer supervision feedback, and they were getting results. Teaching was better, students were more engaged, uh, teachers were learning more, uh, graduation actually started to go up. And, uh, uh, and so, yet these were the same people. So we have a bunch of people at the beginning who are against something, and three years later, 
the same people, they're in favor of it. So I said to the deputy uh, principal who was in charge of the project, I said, this is amazing from a change point of view, because you've got people who have changed their minds. Uh, and so I'll, I said, I want to ask you a killer change question. And, uh, and so he said, what is it? I said, is participation in this peer coaching feedback, is it mandatory or voluntary for teachers? He didn't he hesitate a second. He said, it's voluntary, but inevitable. <laughs> Think about that, voluntary, but inevitable. Uh, and what, what did they do? When they first got uh, had this first discussion, they said, all right, we understand you're, you're uh, wary about it. You don't have to do it. We just like two or three people to try it, see what it's like, and report back. So they did that. Secondly, they said, even if you do it and you get feedback, you don't have to follow the feedback. We want you to uh, learn from, from it, but it's up to you what you choose. So they made it, they made it easier and more voluntarily to do that and to test it out. Because when people are against things, sometimes they don't know what they don't know. Though they may be against it but not know enough about it. So this, this important part of, uh, of giving change a, a chance, of looking inside it, of not being too emphatic. In fact, I would go so far, not quite, but almost this, this way, to say it this way. If you want to kill a good idea, mandate it. If you want to stop a good idea, tell people they have to do it. And then the psychology of change, you can just see it coming up. Because good ideas have to prove themselves through the, uh, the combination. So if we look then at focus direction, this is very important because uh, it has to be, you have to figure out how to get started in a way that doesn't impose it, but helps people define it. And so we often start with moral purpose, and I want to ask you to uh, uh, take a look at this. This is where I'll ask you to do something uh, individually, and then at the, uh, in about four or five minutes, I'll ask you to talk to each other in groups of twos or threes. Uh, at the end of your handout, there's a worksheet that, allow, that has these questions. What is your moral purpose? Uh, what actions are you taking? Uh, what do you, uh, how do you know you're getting anywhere? I'd like you to just uh, spend three minutes individually now writing response uh, in that two, one, two sentences. How would you answer this for yourself? I won't ask you to share a lot of the content, but I want to take this uh, somewhere and first of all get you to focus on moral purpose. What is it? What actions are you taking? Well, how are you working with others to get, get it? And how do you know you're making any progress? So three minutes over to you. I want to uh, stop and dwell on moral purpose with you because almost all uh, goals and vision statements and strategic plans emphasize moral purpose. We're in, we're, this is our, our work is to uh, uh, raise the bar, close the gap for all students that we're working with. So that's the aspiration. The problem is it's only on paper. So we want to make it more problematic, more more challenging. Uh, what is it about moral purpose? How do you actually get, get uh, going in this development? And then it becomes uh, much more difficult because now the questions we've asked you here, not only is what your moral purpose, but how do you interact with other teachers about moral purpose? How do you know you're getting somewhere in this development? And that this is where we want to open it up and talk about uh, uh, how, how do we, uh, when we know that some schools do well and other schools with the same types of students don't do as well, something's different here. There's a variation of something. So I want to suggest it this way. Uh, when you think about moral purpose, let me ask this question. Uh, if I were to ask teachers, can all students learn? Almost all teachers, I think, would say yes. But if I'm looking at a school where all students are not learning, for three, four, five years. I doubt very much if those teachers in those schools deep down really believe that these students can learn because they're not learning. How could they possibly believe it? I'm not saying they're lying. I'm saying there's something going on here psychologically that we have to get and open up and begin to, to do that. Because when people are thinking that all students, uh, let's take that, the, 
if we got inside the souls of those people and tried to figure out what is uh, making them uh, think that way. And then we'd ask them um, about, ask the question, what would change their minds? All, but all students, these particular students can learn. I can tell you two things that will not change their minds. And it's strange to say it this way, but it's true. One of it is research evidence. Right? You're doing this work. Here's another school just like yours that's getting success. Therefore, it can be done. But research, for a mo in a moment, I'll tell you why it's not convincing. The second uh, thing that's not convincing is I call it increased moral exhortation. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it means that you emphasize moral purpose at louder. You say it louder just to, because it's so important. And the reason that those two things don't work is the first one says it can be done. The second one says it should be done. Neither of them help the teacher get it done. So that's why it doesn't work. What is going to help the teacher change their mind? If they start having new experiences with students in relatively non-threatening circumstances with help from others, that now these students are starting to learn more, and then they see it, they experience, they start to believe it. This is why change is so difficult. I don't believe it until I do it, but I'm not sure I want to do it because I don't know how to do it. And so getting started in this is really this part of uh, making sure we think of moral purpose as a, uh, as, as a process of transforming the, the, not the actual ability and commitment to do this. Let me ask you a more interesting question. I'm not even going to answer it. I'll just ask it rhetorically. Can all teachers learn? That's a very interesting question. Uh, the answer better be yes. <laughs> it doesn't mean 100% will learn, but in the same way we think of students, we should be able to say that all teachers will learn and get better. In fact, that's the definition of a professional. Always getting better because you're delving into this. So I'm just opening up the dynamics of this. This brings us to uh, collaboration, uh, because collaboration we already have found out that collaboration is one of the most powerful strategies we know of, but. And here's the but. Collaboration by itself isn't necessarily a good thing. You can collaborate to do nothing. You can collaborate to do the wrong thing and not even know it sometimes. So it's only a particular kind of collaboration. We also use the, the phrase capacity, increased capacity. And then we say, yes, increased capacity. We usually mean better pedagogy, uh, working together more effectively. We also find that capacity by itself is too vague. And then you start to move to be more specific. That's where I want to go with you. In PLCs, they've made it somewhat specific. It still is an interesting question for us. There was, an in, there was a study done in 2015 by the Boston Consulting Group in the US uh, with, uh, funded by the Gates Foundation, and they studied PLCs across the US. And this is what they found, and it's curious except when you think it through. They found that principals, school principals liked PLCs more than teachers liked them. Think about that. Principals liked PLCs more than teachers liked PLCs. I think the answer to that is because teachers were not owning enough the substance of what was happening, and that, that, that principals were, were the ones that had, in the US at least, latched on to this as a solution. And then when they asked teachers what, how would they like to learn, they named all the things that were in PLC design. They said, we like to learn with other teachers, we like to have some time to get better, we want to get more specific, so you got a lot of uh, that. So, what I'm, what I'm wanting to do is getting at more precise and more effective forms of collaboration. There are six sticky phrases I, uh, that we've derived from the change work we've done. These, uh, a sticky phrase is an insight that is valuable and stays with you. And so that's where I'm going to be. Uh, I'm going to highlight those six. There's a slide later with all six of them. These are insights about change that we've learned by doing it. And the one that I want to just surface here is the difference between precision and prescription. There's a very big difference. 
Precision is when you're specific and clear about something. Prescription is when you make it an order, that you have to do it. So what works, and you'll see the subtleties have changed, there aren't that many, is if you can get more and more specificity or precision without imposing it, you've got both, both things that are necessary for, for effectiveness. And we have found that when things get more specific and people don't feel like they're being judged and, and, and change imposed on them, they start to like what's specific because it works. And I want to show you now a, a, a very interesting uh, graph. Uh, raise your hand if you know or heard about the work of John Hattie in visible learning. So probably a third of you. So I'm not particularly emphasizing this, but this John is a you know, good colleague of ours. He's from New Zealand. He now works out of Melbourne in Australia. And he has, over the last 10 years, developed this visible learning set of uh, findings where he's looked at specific teaching pedagogy, linked it to results with students, and, said, and calculated what he calls effect sizes. Effect sizes are uh, uh, how much impact does a given strategy. So he finds, for example, feedback to students uh, specific has a good impact. Or something else like, uh, um, like metacognition of helping students understand the nature of learning. That also has. But about eight years ago, I said to him, your work is getting more and more focus. It's getting better. And you are uh, helping teachers see what is more effective. But I said, the problem with it, the limitation, is that all of the things you're looking at are the individual pedagogical practices of teachers. We happen to know that the group work is more, is more effective than the individual work. Just makes sense if you've got the group doing the good specific things. I said, what do you know about collaboration and its impact? And he said, we haven't really looked at that enough yet, but I will start to look at it now. So he shifts the emphasis, adds collaboration as a focus, and starts to assess and amass the research evidence. And in its effect sizes, he says about the as a statistical measure that an effect size of 0 0.40 approximately is uh, worth looking at. And if you go up from there, it's still not very powerful, but it's worth looking at. If you go up from there into higher numbers, you start to get really uh, having an impact. So a few months ago, he wrote uh, with a couple of other colleagues a short article, six pages long, reporting on the findings. And that's what I want to uh, emphasize for you. If you look at this, uh, table, there's the article in the bottom of it, is the uh, factors that influence uh, student learning. And you'll see there's several of his, uh, the three, four, five, six, seven, or eight, the ones below the top one, they're about uh, how individual teachers with certain skills are getting results. But they're all not very strong necessarily. And then you add collective efficacy. And there's a few, a few terms that I want to uh, sort out here. I don't find the word collaboration very useful because it's too vague. So I'm, we don't use it without qualifying what it is. Uh, and uh, there's, two or th there's only, I guess, maybe two or three words that are concepts that are the right ones to use. They they're more or less mean the same thing. His is collective advocacy. Ours is collaborative professionalism. Andy Hargraves, who works with me, myself, we tend to, they're the same thing. But look at this is, this is confirmatory, but it's also astounding, I think, that collective efficacy, and we'll get on the next slide what his definition, the components of it, collective efficacy blows everything else out of the water. In fact, what a collective efficacy is, it's leveraging those below that top line uh, with the group doing it in a focused way to get, that's why they get the results. And then when he turns to uh, collective efficacy, he says, and it's all four of these that are important. Uh, um, we don't like to, a long list, but we don't like a list of one either, because things are interactive. So you have to have the smallest number. This is his four. He says one of the four pieces of collective efficacy is the joint expectation that a group has that they will, high expectations that they'll get results. The belief that they will get results, not by itself, but necessary, so that's one thing. Secondly, 
They pay attention to impact. What's the evidence that we're getting somewhere? How do we know that this is really uh, uh, working? And, that, uh, and by paying attention to impact, that's also. All four of these interact, remember, so keep track of that. The third one is that they're putting into practice stra pedagogical strategies that have some proven value. So they're, they're focusing on things that do work. And the fourth one is about uh, how uh, leaders are interacting with all four of these things to get these results. So I'm trying to, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> get into a nutshell here, <coughs> the essence of the collaboration that's working. And I'm gonna give you a couple of other uh, twists to this in a minute, but for now, I hope you're thinking about collective efficacy. I'd like you to turn to the person beside you, so it might be a total of three people, but not much more than that, and say, what do you think about what I've been saying? I've, I've emphasized collective efficacy. I've said it's more powerful than anything else. What's your reaction to that? Uh, it, it's an open-ended question. Your reaction might be, that's what we're doing and we're getting those results, or we're not doing enough, we better do more, or I'm skeptical anyways because it wastes time to collaborate. Whatever it is, give your reaction to each other. About four minutes, go ahead. <laughs> what I'm doing with each of these pieces is I'm, my goal is to add clarity to things that are, can easily be used vaguely. So people can say PLC, and they can mean five different things about it. They can talk about collaboration and mean a lot of different things. So we want to get more precise, more clear about it. And there's a couple of more pieces to this that I want to clarify. I've just clarified a minute ago that collective efficacy has precision and it's powerful. And it really replaces the vague talk about PLCs. Or if you like, when PLCs are working, they would have these characteristics. But there's two more pieces I want to be crystal clear about. One is leadership, and the other is the relationship between autonomy and collaboration. These are both uh, controversial uh, issues in this. So let's go to leadership. And uh, in this, um, in a book I did in 2014 called The School Principle, I said some interesting things are going here, and I don't know the you know, the history in Quebec about the role of school leaders, but I do know in uh, the U.S. and somewhat in Ontario that school leaders used to be managers mainly. They ran a good school. And then it started to shift towards in the, what the U.S. calls instructional leadership. And this is where it got a bit wrong. So in the book, I review that because what I was seeing is that somehow people, and I'll, I'll give you the correct interpretation of the research, but somehow decision makers got the message about 10 years ago that principals should be instructional leaders. So people like Ken Leithwood, one of our colleagues and others, they said, well, the principal's the second most important person in the school in terms of influence on student learning. The first most is teachers, and then the principal is second most. So people said, well, principal is instructional leader. So what happened is that uh, policy-wise, Policymakers said, we agree with that, so we'll change the role description of the principal. Now you're instructional leader. We'll change the criteria of promotion. We only want to promote uh, and appoint instructional leaders. And furthermore, because this is the way they do it in the U.S., is that we'll have supervisors at the school board level who will make sure principals are doing this work. They'll monitor them and supervise it. I call that micromanagement madness. And, uh, and because what it <clears throat> was starting to look like, <clears throat> excuse me, they were mobilizing this kind of leadership to focus on this. And I would say, thank goodness for the US because they always do the wrong thing first. <laughs> so we can learn from it before it's too late. Yeah. And this is a case where we did. So we said, what's going on here? This doesn't seem right. Uh, the instructional leadership is actually not what they're saying it is. So then this took me to, uh, this book, and I'll give you the, uh, the, the part, the key finding, and there are three key findings there, but the, the most important one is the one at the bottom, which is the principal participate is a lead learner. Not the instructional leader, doesn't have to be the best pedagogue in the building, but is a lead learner in the sense of helping the group and individuals in the group learn more. So we have the three, I'm not gonna dwell on the other two, I'll just mention them. 
the systemness uh, uh, one on the left, that's really the recognition, and this is again a part of the evolution of the job description. Uh, we believe this to be the case, necessarily so, that school principals and leaders of other, all kinds at the school level have to think of themselves as system players. My job is not only to do a good job in my piece of it, but I also have to contribute to other schools. And this is what we'll, we'll start to look at, the interactions of uh, schools uh, with each other. We've got, the system is going to get better because I'm going to pay attention to it. And if I put it uh, strongly, I would say it this way. School, the, jo the job description of the school principal needs to become, my job is to develop the collaborative culture within my school, and it's to influence and, and make a contribution to other schools where I can. It, my job description is just not inside my school. The system is it. And we would go so far as to say the unit of change is the school board, not one school at a time. Multiple schools, in other words. If you've got 50 schools or 30 or whatever the number is, the whole set of schools on the move is not just the responsibility of the director general. It's the responsibility of everybody in the system. So that's what we mean by systemness. And then change leaders have to do some of the skills. So I went to the research, the actual research. Uh, Vivian Robinson is the main, uh, was main person. She studied the uh, role of the principal across all kinds of examples and then uh, calculated the effect size as much like John Hattie does. And she said there are five things that make a difference. And uh, remember the 0 .40 is significant but weak. So she said uh, focusing on objectives, getting resources like time and money, uh, ensuring that there's good quality of individual teachers, and then I'm gonna dwell on number four in a moment. Say, number five is safe. Look at number four way more important than the other, uh, the other four. Uh, and it shows, and what it is is this. It is the degree to which the principal participates as a learner. That's the phrase I would want you to remember. Participates as a learner with teachers in moving the school forward. And this is a key. This means that the principal, you start to think about this participating as a learner. It means that if I'm a new principal, and I don't participate as a learner, but I do the other four things, and I do that for five years, my first five years of my career, at the end of the fifth year, I'll be as good as I was at the beginning. Five, five times nothing is nothing. I haven't learned much because I haven't participated as a learner. If I participate as a learner, then, and we have a lot of, if you go to my YouTube channel, uh, just name uh, two schools you can look at, Park Manor, uh, the principal's name is James Bond, so you, you can remember that. He's not the real James Bond, but that's his real name. And uh, they, uh, he took, you can see in this video, usually our videos are four or five minutes. Uh, longer versions are sometimes eight minutes. And what he did was go into a school uh, called Park Manor that had grade six, seven, and eight in, uh, in Ontario. And the school, when he arrived, he saw what was there. They had nine classrooms, nine teachers, 300 students all together. And every classroom well, was an island in itself, instructionally. They were, the teachers liked each other. There was lots of collegiality and friendliness and good atmosphere, but they had no idea how each other were teaching. So what would you do if you were a principal and you believed in this kind of participate as a learner and you go into that school and you see nine islands with no cross-learning. How do you get cross-learning without offending the teachers? How do you get them to see the value of it? And this is where the art of change comes into play. And there's a, there's, it goes back to what we know about change. You, uh, you try to work it out jointly. Uh, you, uh, you model it. You participate as a learner. You create a, an atmosphere of trust. He did all of those things and they began then to see what it was like. He participated in that. He didn't impose anything, but he enabled it. That's what I said at the beginning. And they began then to learn from each other. I'll just give you one concrete example. They have a protocol where every Friday they have an hour, the three grade six teachers have an hour, 
and the three grade seven teachers have an hour and so in grade eight. And what they do with this protocol, they actually have all of their students, the 300 students, they, have, they know but with post-its how well these students are doing individually in literacy and math, and on the back of it, the post-it is how they're fitting in socio-emotionally. So they take in this protocol, the teachers sit down, they take one of their students, I'm, I'm the teacher, there's two others with me. I said, this is so-and-so. I've been done the following things. These things are working. This student is making progress. But I'm stuck on something. What do you think? And then the three interact. Then they go on to the second one and the third one. And in each case, they are uh, uh, the, uh, in the space of an hour, they've just all, all of a sudden got, had to articulate their own situation. They had to listen to, uh, to others. And they began to say, how do you do that? I want to go and show me, show me how this happens. Keep, keep going in this interactive fashion. So you just increase this. And let me give you also a piece of uh, compatible research from the PLC domain. A group of researchers, two of them, studied eight <laughs> middle schools in the US. In one district, uh, four of them uh, were, uh, they're all doing PLCs. In another district, they're all doing PLCs. When they asked the teachers questions on a survey, uh, like, uh, do you believe in collaborating with other teachers? There was no difference across the eight schools. Yeah, most of us believe in this, et cetera. When they asked the following type of question, to what extent do you sit down with other teachers, examine student work, and in particular student work, and change your teaching as a result of it? Only the schools in the one district said, yeah, that's what we do. The others said, we don't do that. So what you see here is a more substantial version of a PLC. Guess which district got more results? The district that had the specificity. They were implementing this at a, as a, at a level. So it's, the, it's really the number four part here. And then um, it, uh, the, the bout of uh, precision is that leaders keep looking at how are we getting anywhere? Are we making progress? What's the, what's the development of this and how do we, how do we go from there? So what, where we're thinking about collaboration now, we have a much better idea internal to the school. Let's call it intra-school collaboration, inside the school. And collaboration, when it's done with specificity, works. You saw it from John Hattie. In the case of James Bond and Park Manor, they, uh, their uh, writing scores, grade six, on the province-wide test from EQAO, went from 42% high proficiency to 83% in four years. It got results. It's linked to the actual outcome of getting results. So then we begin to uh, talk about this. One of the um, controversial issues with uh, this, and I, I hope this will come up in the Q&A as well, is what's the, what about autonomy and what about uh, uh, collaboration? How do they go together? Do they go together? And we've had running discussions with the teacher unions in Ontario, and it goes something like this. They, at the beginning, um, uh, teacher leaders will say, we're professionals, let us be autonomous and do our work and stop imposing these things on us that are distracting us from our good work. And we say, well, that doesn't sort of that doesn't get the results. That doesn't really deal with what we're learning about collective efficacy. And so we have we talk further, and then the conversation shifts to okay, we believe in collaboration, but let us decide how to collaborate. Leave it to us. In other words, each time it's leaving us alone. So what you get this is running battle between autonomy and collaboration, and that uh, with teachers saying. I don't get enough autonomy with the uh, policymakers. I'm saying there's not enough collaboration. What's going on here? And this is where we got the breakthrough. And here is the breakthrough. It's very important. And it's very commonsensical once you name it. If you take, uh, just start with this. Autonomy is not isolation. We have a word for isolation. It's called isolation. <laughs> and if you're isolated in life, You'll deteriorate. Isolation, if you're on your own all the time, you'll deteriorate. And so we then began to uh, say that, well, what is autonomy? If it's not isolation, what could it be? What's the positive version of that? It goes like this, and it makes common sense once you say it so clearly. 
Autonomy is that I have good ideas as me, as an individual. When I go to the group, I contribute my ideas to the group, and other people contribute theirs, and I learn something there. And think of it this way, I'm, I don't mean it this literally, but today I'm autonomous, I've got good ideas. Tomorrow I'm collaborating, and I contribute, and I learn. The next day after that, I'm better autonomously, and so back and forth, back and forth. Autonomy is good, isolation is bad. Autonomy is when you're own, your own person. But you better be also in the group, because you need to test your ideas, you need to get other ideas, you need to contribute to other people's development. So we call it connected autonomy, we call it collaborative professionalism, the word that Andy uses mostly now. And collaborative professionalism, or connected autonomy, or collective efficacy, are all the same things. They are groups of teachers working together to get more precise and impacting things. And because of that, they are also better individually. And when they try things individually and bring it to the group, it's a virtuous reciprocal relationship and development. So this begins to uh, develop this. I'm not going to uh, ask you to look at this in detail. I did an interesting real life experiment last year. We were working in Garden Grove, which is a district in Anaheim, California. Uh, very 80 schools, a lot of uh, difficulty in terms of uh, a lot of poverty, uh, uh, diversity, much to be done. And the school, uh, the district got quite successful. So we filmed two or three schools. One of the schools we filmed was uh, uh, K3 Peters. 600 students, all in kindergarten to grade three. And they were very successful. They were stagnant. Principal came in, did the things that we talked about. It's, it, you could go to my YouTube channel and see the clip on K3 Peters to see how that principal did that. Uh, went from isolation to collaboration that got results. And then after that, uh, the principal got moved. And when I was on camera with her uh, in K3 Peters, I said, uh, you know, what are your plans? What, what are uh, you now? This is your fifth year. And she said, yes, this is my fifth year. And I gave myself about five years to develop a collaborative culture to the point then where I could leave tomorrow and the school would carry on without me, she said. And uh, this is actually an interesting definition of leadership if you want it. Uh, leadership is, effective leadership, is when a leader develops a collaborative culture for five or six years to the point where they become dispensable. This is a good way of putting it. Uh, after five or six years, I better have developed a collaborative culture where there are leaders in there that can carry on without me. So that's not my main point because K3 Peters did continue. Uh, but the principal, whose name is Michelle, got transferred to another school in the same district that was also stagnant, not going anywhere, called Heritage. And then I said, let's do a real life experiment. You now know how to combine autonomy and collaboration from the K3 Peters. When you go to the new school, I said, see how fast you can change the culture. Really change it so that teachers are embracing the new thing. And that when, um, and I said, all I will do, I won't help you, but all I will do is every six months I'll send you a question. And I just want you to respond in, uh, by email in a couple of pages. So she arrived there in the summer. I said her question said, what's the lay of the land and what are you going to do? first. In January, I sent another question, how is it going so far? You're in there for half a year. And then the following summer, the same, and then uh, I did four iterations. And then um, the results started to come in, and this is their survey. This is agree and uh, strongly agree. Uh, their survey that the district does a, a climate survey of each uh, school. These are teachers responding, 2016 is before she arrived, 2017 is when she had been there 14 months. And you just look at the, the difference uh, that, uh, about direction, about specificity. And now we have 2018 results. Every one of those numbers on the right-hand column is 100%. 100% of the teachers, 32 teachers, changed from feeling isolated or disconnected, same people, only two people left of the 32, to being collaborative, and they're, of course they're getting results. So I'm, I'm trying to get, kind of be pushy about this because it's starting to look, and you, you'll have questions later, and I, I appreciate that. So this is just the list of some of the things. This article is in the March issue of Educational Leadership, uh, March earlier this year, so you can get the article or you can download it from my uh, website. So I want to give you um, one more thing about uh, collaboration. This uh, result is where uh, from 
uh, from the PISA studies. And the PISA studies and several others have looked at this. They've said variation in the quality of teaching varies greater within a school than between schools. So this means the percentage of ineffective teaching. Variation in the quality of teaching. And this is something that, um, that uh, is tricky because if you think about this, what PLCs do, good ones, what collaborative cultures do, good collaborative cultures, is they reduce bad variation. Let me put it positively. Bad variation is when there's ineffective teaching. And what is going to, uh, and just think of this, let's say I'm a principal, I get appointed as principal, I come into the school, and I say to the staff, I'm here to reduce ineffective teaching. Right? That's my goal. It, I would last about three days. Right? But, but when you think about it is, it, is it a good idea to reduce ineffective teaching? Yeah. So how do you do it, and in quotations, get away with it? And you do it just the way I've been talking about. Not too much, uh, no, no mandatory interaction. People come to see. And if you look at what happens over a period of the, the, the Park Banner School or K3 Peters, is that teachers, over a period of two or three years, uh, because they're interacting, because they're looking at new practices, they jettison the practices that don't work voluntarily, and they retain more of the ones that do. So in a more natural, organic, change the culture way, they're sorting out what works and what doesn't work. And therefore, they end up with a better. We add to this ourselves when we want schools to interact with each other so that you're also reducing bad variation across schools. Schools are interacting. I'll show you one, one school on video. So let me just ask you to take stock here, uh, uh, again with your small group discussion. Uh, I've introduced things, some things that are a little bit controversial about uh, autonomy. Uh, isolation is a bad thing. Autonomy is good. Autonomy is interactive. You need leadership for efficacy, all of that. What do you think so far? And then I'm going to then shift to uh, deep learning for the rest of the time, which is compatible, but we're going to add another agenda. So what do you think so far of my messages? You can agree or disagree. Tell each other. Okay. So we're going to make the shift to uh, deep learning in a minute, but I want, and I've skipped a couple of slides because I want to get to the, spend enough time on deep learning. I do want to address accountability, uh, which is the uh, fourth part, so we'll double back to deep learning as the third quadrant. And in it, uh, we make the distinction, and when you have a chance to read co coherence in, in French, there's a chapter on evaluation that's much more elaborate than I can say in five minutes. But here's the point. Uh, Richard Elmore, one of our colleagues, said this in 2004. He said, no amount of external accountability will be effective in the absence of internal accountability. He said, internal accountability is when people are accountable to themselves and their own group about how well we're doing. And in the book, we have uh, several quotes of people who've done it. And when they, they actually don't use the word accountability very often, they use uh, responsibility individual and collective responsibility. And he also says, uh, Richard says, if you, an internal accountability, he said, no amount of external accountability will be effective in the absence of internal accountability. In other words, policymakers are wasting their time if they load up accountability as policy. We've written about this, it's very clear. They still do it because they're politicians, but it's not effective. And what is effective, because you can't say we don't like bad accountability, which is when it's imposed, therefore we, only, we won't have any accountability. That doesn't seem acceptable. We want to know what good accountability is. And all the things I'm talking about are tantamount to good accountability, because the, the school gets better, the results are better, and the teachers in those situations, and the principal, come to have what I'm going to call assessment literacy. Not literacy assessment, assessment literacy. And assessment literacy is when you're empowered in two ways, professionally and politically. Professionally, you're empowered because you know what you're doing. You can explain it. You, put, you can talk the data. You can hold your own in any debate. Politically, you're empowered because your school is doing well or your, the board's doing well. Your parents know it. The community knows it. So you get really the best of both worlds. So that's what that bottom one means. Uh, the, um, 
This is the one about uh, one of Richard's quotes, which I like. He says, internal accountability logically precedes external accountability. In other words, if you don't get it, you don't get external because the internal is where the power is. So let's now um, go to this one on uh, learning, uh, uh, deep learning, which is, uh, I'm going to start with this uh, graph. This is typical of quite a few graphs I could have pulled out from the research. It shows, in this case, the percentage of teachers at each grade level who, uh, who, uh, who are saying what, what percentage of students are engaged in my class, engaged in learning. And you'll see in kindergarten, let's say, oh, 90, 95%, almost everybody's engaged. It goes down, down, down. It's not much more than a third by the time you get to grade nine. Surveys of students show the same thing. And in fact, this is getting worse because of, for two reasons. The push reason is that I'm going to put, this is not even a criticism. This is just kind of the way things are now. The criticism, uh, if you want to put it that way, is that regular schooling, as we've known it for the last 125 years, is actually boring. That's the push for most students as they go up and up. Uh, and then secondly, the outside, while it's not, it's still dangerous, it is dangerous, it's increasingly pulling people out to it. So you get this dynamic, which means that schooling is no longer fit for what it could do. And we, we saw this four years ago, and we said, we've got to think of not just criticizing the fact that schooling is boring, we've got to have alternatives. And so that's when we began to notice schools like Park Manor and others, and we created a deep learning initiative. Most of the things we've learned in four years, and they're in this, now in this, um, this book that just came out, uh, Apprentissage uh, en Profondeur, uh, Deep Learning, just out like a week, I think, has, has come out from the publication. Uh, most of the things are in there. Most of the things we learned were a result of learning it from students and teachers and, and school leaders in that book. We didn't have these details four years ago. We've got them now. And we've got them now because we jointly did this together with 1,200 schools in seven different countries. It's the, it's the answer to this. Uh, it's also the answer to this. This is where we're heading, maybe, if we keep school the way it is. This, that class size will be no problem. Right. <laughs> OK. So uh, this is the book, Deep Learning. Engage the world, change the world. And I'm going to give you a flavor of this. I'm going to give you at least uh, probably two videos, I think, um, to get it. But let's look at the essence of it. Um, this is what the new solution has to entail. It's got to result in engaging, exciting learning for students and teachers. That's the pedagogy. It's got to be, uh, make it easy to access technology, the second one. It's got to also uh, think about technology being ubiquitous. Uh, to put it one way, you can get twice the learning at the same cost when people are learning more, because they're learning not just nine to three. Students and groups, you'll see them. And then uh, the last one about big deep learning. What is deep learning? Again, this is what we have found, that deep learning is quality learning that sticks with you the rest of your life. If we are in a day-long workshop now, I could ask you to uh, think of any learning that you've had in your life so far that has stuck with you. And then you could tell each other, and I say, what are the conditions under which that has happened? That's what we'll see, and that's what we see in our deep learning examples. The two videos I'm going to show you are crystal clear on that point. And then it's also, uh, this was the biggest surprise, the pleasant surprise. Deep learning is learning that involves students examining the world in some fashion and wanting to change it. Students are great change agents. Uh, we haven't found a student young enough that's not a change agent. And so that this uh, unleashing, really, of incredible power of students being change agents with teachers. It's a very different, we'll give you our model, but it's a very different uh, proposition. So uh, it sticks with you the rest of your life. It involves passion, it involves uh, teamwork, and it's uh, work that's devoted to changing the world. And this is one of the biggest, uh, greatest surprises. It's also deep learning is good for all students, but it's especially good for students who are disconnected. 
It's especially good for those students because what we do with students who are disconnected, we give them more boring work to make sure they catch up, right? Which they don't. So um, we uh, had our breakthrough in some sense was to rethink the outcomes. And we said the learning outcomes, we still believe in literacy, numeracy, high school graduation. So that's, that's a core. But in addition to that, a deeper learning way of thinking about it is to say, what does is, what is a student in this world have to be at the end of their, uh, let's say, high school? What do they have to be good at? What are some of the global competencies? Uh, one, and we've selected C, so the six Cs. I'll comment on them in a moment. But <clears throat> one way of putting this is to say, is it possible for a student to get good grades all the way through school these days and graduate and still not be good at life? You know the answer to that. You can get your good grades, but you may not be equipped for life because life is more complex. And these six C's, four of them have been around for 20 years, uh, the four, for 24th, 21st century learning skills. They haven't gone very far. Uh, some of them do it a little. When we added two, character and citizenship, those two, which were not in the original list, the whole thing flourished because character and citizenship have to do with me as a learner. They touch me directly. Whereas the others are, well, I should learn that, I should learn that. And what we've been doing, and we have protocols and, uh, and uh, um, rubrics around each of these six three, we've defined them. We've also shown you how you can teach them. We have modules about how to do this. In our, uh, in our kind of development, and I know some of you are interested in joining our deep learning schools and, and districts, is that we, uh, we want people to come into this not to do our deep learning work, but to go in a direction that they think they want to go in anyways, and they use us to get there. And this is why the reciprocity of doing this together is so important to the nature of how we do it. So we have been working with those six Cs, implementing them, and uh, I want to show you now, do I have a, yeah, I think we do, just uh, with a group of three, uh, just do this quickly, letter off A, B, C, just within your group. And if there's four of you, it could be A, B, C, uh, A. If there's two of you, it could be A, B, B, or A, A, B. You know, so you get my, cover the A, B, C. Just do that for 30 seconds so I know you've got a letter. In, just beside you, beside each other. A or B or C. Okay, so let me, uh, let me do it just a quick check. Um, I'll go to Claude. What, I, what letter are you? A. He, so Claude's A. How about you? B? Okay, you're a B. So you've got an A, a B, or a C. Uh, this is a four and a half minute clip. When you look at this, I want you to uh, make a note to yourself. If you're an A, where do, I, do, I, where do, I, do I see character and citizenship in this clip or not? And if so, write it down. Or if you're a B or a C. This is called Young Minds of the Future. And it's a clip from a school in Australia that we work with. Australia started first, so they have more videos that they produced. We have other videos in Canada now that are coming at us all the time. We no longer have to go and seek videos. They come at us because people use videos to explain themselves. So look at this as one example. These are 10 and 11 year olds, for example, and see what you think, A, B, C. At Canterbury Primary School today, we're hosting Young Minds of the Future Expo, where three schools have come together, Chatham Primary, Ringwood North Primary and Canterbury, to do a project all about the future. We each have to research a problem and then create something to solve it. Seeing all these amazing inventions everywhere is awesome. The community's really been great. We've had over 50 people come to our store so far. I've seen so many cool things, from little juice cups to feeding the homeless to transportation, things like our idea. We've even seen around the world subways. So this is the automatic dog feeder. You'd set the timer as for three o'clock, as you can see with the wires in there. And then as the day would go past, it hit that, which sent the current through, and then the dog food would fall down. I thought of it because both my parents go to work and we go to school, and my dog's always left outside at home and she usually just sleeps, so at night she's up. I think it would be really great for the owners and also their pets' lives and their relationships between each other. Our idea is a sober sensor, which basically is a steering wheel, 
that will scan for drugs and alcohol through the square. As to why we want this, is to uh, contribute to the Towards Zero Fund, which is an initiative that will hopefully stop drink driving on the roads and make sure that less people die on our roads. I decided to make the light pot because I love plants and water and all the beautiful things in nature and I don't want it to disappear. This will help people look after their plants better and also save water. It shows when your plants is, is not watered because there's no energy in the dirt. So the light won't go on. But when it's wet, the light will go on. To show this plant is watered, you don't need to water it anymore. We decided to make cricket flower cookies because the population growth on Earth is really fast. Livestock is just not that sustainable. Cows are one of the largest producers of methane on Earth and methane can contribute to greenhouse gases. However, insects don't let out any methane, so they can reduce greenhouse gases. So when we found out that in the United States alone, there were 4,000 drownings between 2005 and 2014, we thought we had to do something. So we invented a drone that flies over your head and drops a life buoy to save you. So while the lifeguards come and swim out to you, um, you're floating there ready for them. Just walking through this small exhibition, looking at all the new inventions, it really just makes you think, oh, that's a good idea and that could help me every day. And like some of them are really cool and I could get and find them really helpful. Events like Young Minds of the Future is important because it's a chance to work with other people from other schools and hear other people's ideas. We believe that most of these ideas will make it into the real world. If not, they will be considered and people will know about them. It shows kids creativity and it lets people have their own point of view. In Young Minds of the Future, we didn't really have a standard. We didn't have to make a certain thing. We got to do basically anything that we thought would change the world and I find that really interesting. Uh, we have probably uh, over a hundred videos like that. They're typically four, five minutes long at max, three, four, five. And we used to, when we started this, produce our own videos 10, 10 12 years ago. And uh, because videos weren't so normal then. And when we, when we uh, pr tried to produce them, we'd select a school and then we'd say the school we want to come out with a couple of cameras and capture what you're doing. And then we found this, this was before people were used to this media, that they would study themselves first. They would study what they were going to say. So when we got there, they had memorized what they're going to say or they thought they had. And then they start to talk and they'd sweat and they couldn't talk, talk, they couldn't be clear and back and forth and that. So nowadays, we don't do that because people are developing these videos for themselves and part of our arrangement with them is they're sharing them. And that uh, when they do this, they really have, uh, uh, they really do uh, use it for multiple purposes. One of the six sticky phrases that we uh, have is called the capacity to talk the walk. So whatever you're doing, and what you saw there, students incredibly articulate. They never had to practice that, because that's what they do. Those were three schools learning from each other over a period of uh, six weeks. And so they don't, they just, the clarity comes tripping off their tongue. In fact, on coherence, if I, I could go into one of your schools, if I could speak French better, and, uh, and I could tell after two hours whether you had coherence or not. Because all I would have to do is take four different teachers separately and say, tell me about the goals of the school. Uh, what are you doing to fulfill them? How much progress are you making? And what steps are next? So I take them four separately. No, they don't talk to each other. If the school has coherence, I will get consistency and specificity. If it doesn't have coherence, I'll get vagueness and contradiction. Talk the walk is an indicator that coherence has happened. And uh, these, uh, these videos are, are like that. We, have, uh, uh, we will convert our best videos en français. We've done this in Spanish because one of our uh, groups is Uruguay in Latin America. And so all of our videos that we use there are, are uh, 
uh, Spanish sub subtitles or they're in Spanish because they're producing them in Spanish and they have English subtitles. So this is coming as a media. So I want to now get a little more analytical and say, what is our actual model that we've developed in the four years? And it starts with deep learning. These are the six C's. Uh, that's what they are. And then we surround it with, uh, I guess I'll call it the pedagogy. There are four things. One are the pedagogical practices themselves. Another is the importance of partnerships between and among students, teachers, and parents. A third is changing the learning environment. And a fourth is leveraging digital, going connecting to, to digital. We have rubrics for each of these four that have been co-developed with the uh, groups we're working with. And, uh, and that's, that's the, the essence of the model, if you like, but it's got a lot of uh, visual a kind of energy in it coming from the videos you'll see. Another thing we have is school conditions, another set of uh, uh, protocols. It's basically the collaborative culture of the school. Is, is the school got a collaborative culture? Uh, so that's just situating that. The next one we have is the district conditions, which is the school board, uh, or in the case of Finland, it's the municipalities because they're the ones that are responsible for the schools. And in the case of New Zealand, it's the networks of schools because they don't have districts. So whatever the local cluster is, and then we have system conditions, which are policies. So this, again, we try to be as succinct as we can, but also comprehensive. Because if you leave one of these out, it doesn't work. And although we don't mind leaving out system conditions, uh, in one sense, because we're not going to spend a lot of time trying to convince politicians if they're not going in that same direction. We'd rather build it from the bottom and the middle up so it puts pressure on the policies. That's how that works. So uh, here's our emergent discoveries, we call them. Helping humanity is a big theme. <clears throat> life and learning. There's no distinction between life and learning. Students are agents of change. Students say to us about citizenship, they basically say, I don't want to be a citizen of tomorrow 10 years from now. I want to be a citizen of tomorrow today. Because that's what that's, the world needs us, me. And the energy coming from students is unstoppable, unbelievable, but it has to be enabled. Uh, work, uh, intrinsic motivation, this is all about the tribe to make a difference. And uh, these three C's we've turned, we found out, they're catalytic. It means if you start with any one of these three, they ramify. So we don't say, okay, do all six C's starting tomorrow. We say, where are you gonna start? And in Ottawa Catholic, which is one of our districts, they have 83 schools. All 83 now after four years are doing uh, the six C's. They're required, so to speak, to select at least one C. They can't stop at one. It's impossible to stop at one, but they can have a choice. Where do we start in this? And then um, uh, this, the, the, the discovery about inequity has been a fantastic one. Uh, strategies for inequity, good for all, especially good for students who are not connected. And then um, these are my six uh, sticky phrases. Start slow to go fast. Uh, in other words, if, <clears throat> if you're a leader, you want to be able to start somewhere, but in all of those cases of success we have on video, the, the principal, for example, went in and said, I had to build relationships, I had to build a, a degree of trust. And as soon as I was able to do some of that, we started to do things. And when we started to do things, it accelerated. So it was slow and then it ramped up. Second one, uh, this about uh, talk the walk again, I mentioned that. Third one, Use the group to change the group. This instead of the leader trying to change one person at a time, you mobilize the group, the group interacts. Guess what happens? They change. The multiples are much, much better. Precision, not prescription. And that uh, the part about autonomy and uh, interaction, trust and interaction. This is an interesting thing about trust. A, uh, Ronald Reagan, when he was president, trying to make a deal with Gorbachev, uh, K, um, asked his interpreter, give me a Russian proverb because I want to you know, pretend I know something. And uh, he got, so the one he got was trust but verify. 
trust but verify. What this means is I don't trust you, actually. And we get a deal, and then I look over your shoulder and make sure you're doing it. Or, uh, that. So, but the other one, trust and interact, is very different. This is participating as a learner under conditions of trust. If, I'm, if we have a relationship of trust and we're interacting, I don't have to worry about accountability. Why? Because I'm there. I'm interacting. I don't need a second opinion. I can see it. I'm part of it. And then um, this part about uh, uh, go outside to learn inside is really uh, important that you don't stay just within your school, that you go beyond that. Uh, the new leadership, I think, I'll just let, let you, because I want to get to the questions now. Uh, <clears throat> the new leadership that we're talking about is uh, the best uh, single thing I can think about expressing it is co-learning. The leader is a learner. Co-learning with, uh, with teachers and with students. And in fact, one of the nice distinctions in the, in the literature on this is that leaders have to be, uh, I love this distinction, have to be apprentices and experts at the same time. They should know something, that's the expert part, but they also have to learn something from others. In fact, a lot of our leaders say, I learned so much from teachers, from students, I've learned so much. So being a learner, but you can't be just a learner all the time, you have to have some good ideas. And the more you learn, you have good ideas, so it's back and forth, expert, apprentice, and developing from there. Uh, this is one I'm just going to introduce to you and not, uh, not ask you to do it, although you have the material. One of the schools in Australia <clears throat> took our notion about excellence and good for all, all students, especially those, and they used the metaphor of the canary, uh, the canary in the mines that many of you will know about. The canary in the mines are miners having canaries in the mine who detect when something is wrong with the air, too much methane or carbon monoxide, whatever. And the canaries notice it first, and they ring the alarm bell, and then uh, there's some advanced warning. Uh, so we adapted that. This school adapted it, and I've been using it very, very well lately, which is to, uh, and if we had a longer workshop, we could do this, is to think of a student in your class that could be a canary child, who is somebody who is not doing well, not high profile, stays on their own, but had you paid attention to it, you could have done something, maybe. And so when we do this now, and I have, I've given you the description on one page, it's towards the end of your handout, of what the canary child definition is. And then on the second page, there's nine questions, I think, about how you might, uh, how you might address this. And we're now seeing that uh, this is the way, this actually is about two of the four things I started with in the triangle, caring relationships and life circumstances. If, you're, if you start to get sensitized to the canary child phenomenon, you will be into the domain of caring relationships and the life circumstance of that individual. And what the, that's the one part of it. The good news is once that's freed up, they take off in learning. Not all of them, but many of them. And there's a whole new key to getting uh, great learning from there. Uh, so leadership in the middle, I just want to end with that before I turn it over to you for questions. It is about freeing up energy in the middle. Uh, this is a little bit of our abstract diagram. I can put it, I can put it this way, uh, succinctly. Wherever you are in the system, when you look upward, don't think of yourself as I'm supposed to implement the policies that are above me. Think of it, we can use the word exploit, but it's a hard, hard word to uh, translate accurately. Uh, think of it as I'm proactive in relation to the things above me which means I'm going to figure out how some of those things can help me with local priorities. So we want the, uh, the center of gravity to shift to the person doing the action, looking upward. Uh, the secondly, if I'm, uh, if I'm upward, so to speak, looking uh, downward, the key concept is liberate. Liberate the group below you. Not the individuals, but the group, because the group, and you're learning what the group and you develop it. And then the third one is lateralize everywhere, which is make sure you expand on that uh, 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 leadership from the middle. <clears throat> so uh, we're going to get some uh, questions now from you. I hope you've been keeping track of them. Just to warm up for yourselves as we shift to this mode, uh, I'll ask you to turn to the person that you've been talking to and pick up the two things I started with this morning, was what's the best idea you got in the last two hours? So think about that. And second, what's the biggest question you have in your mind? 
Best idea, the plus side, biggest question, the, the, uh, the flip side of that coin. I'm going to give you five minutes to generate that, and then we're going to uh, hear from you on either or both of those. Best idea and biggest question. So five minutes to you to get your ideas sorted. So in a minute, I'll invite you. Uh, remember, you have a choice. The choice is the best idea or the biggest question. And so I hope you'll have some of both of those. Whenever we get out of balance, I might ask you to switch to the other one. So we have two microphones up there. And then um, I'm going to have to get, I'm going to be complicated here because I'm going to have three microphones uh, at once. Uh, so when you ask, we'll get the translation. So uh, just put up your hand and uh, you'll get noticed. And just tell us what your best idea was or your biggest question. There's a lot of autonomy out there, but not much collaboration. Yeah. OK, there's one there. One right there beside you. Merci, ah. Anne. Yeah. J'ai bien aimé euh, toute la préoccupation que vous avez pour euh, enlever l'iniquité. Comment peut-on y arriver? Uh, so the question was, how do you get there? Right? Yes. Yes. Uh, well, I gave you a lot of ideas about uh, the do's and don'ts of getting there. And it really is changing the culture of the school. Uh, everything I talked about are people who figured out the how to get there. And what we've done is pull out the insights about that. So think of it this way. Your first thing to think about is what I'm doing is changing the culture. That's the main thing. I'm changing the culture. The way people interact, what they value, and uh, we've given you the coherence framework, which has advice in it. If you look at each of those chapters, it says, how do you go about focusing direction? How do you go about collaboration? How do you go about learning? How do you go about securing accountability? It's all in there. But unlike most things, I guess, it's not a recipe. There is, when you're dealing with numbers of humans, you can't say, okay, let's do the following 10 things that will work. Although I think we have boiled it down to a small number of things, such as a coherence framework, that does work. Another thing you can do is start interacting with other places that have done it. This is our, one of our biggest sources of learning. Uh, we, uh, for example, if you're interested in, uh, what are, let's say, early learning, I wouldn't go to the research on early learning to say, what I, where, where should I start? I would say, who's doing it well? And let's figure out how to cross visit to see what it is they're doing. And then I will get some ideas. Then I might check it out in the research. So there's no, uh, the, uh, the, the, the business of starting into it, knowing that you're changing culture. And then finally, I would say, you're not doing this as a leader without telling other people. You're saying to other people, we want to work on coherence. We want to work on me as a leader, if I'm the leader, which means I'm not going to impose things. We're going to figure out things together. I'm going to have good ideas, but you'll have good ideas. So there's nothing like uh, doing that. And uh, I guess I did say a final thing, but the other thing I would say, if what, you're, if what you're doing is not working, staying doing something that's not working is not very satisfactory either. So you're not losing much by trying to make a change if the current situation isn't satisfactory. And I, I hope if you join the uh, NPDL, as we call it, the deep learning, that there will be schools that join the process in order to work on it, to get good, and have, have support from each other and from us and others to do that. So you have to get going with it. You have to have good support. You have to have good motivation to want to try something. All right. One or two more. Bonjour. Il y a une donnée qui m'a euh, frappé ce matin. Euh, concernant les devoirs, je sais que vous appuyez beaucoup sur les recherches. Je sais que vous avez beaucoup euh, travaillé à ce niveau-là. J'aimerais que vous soyez capable de nous expliquer davantage euh, comment ce concept-là euh, de devoir, euh, comment, euh, comment changer la culture, comment réfléchir, comment le, le repenser, le camper pour nos élèves du 21e siècle. Uh, the answer is I can't. I'll tell you on the spot. Uh, so uh, uh, I think it's one of those things that you can't 
what we say in English, cherry pick one factor, say should we do it or not, because it's a combination of four or five things. I think there is some good work on uh, uh, homework that's uh, valuable, that you take up homework and, uh, and then you take it up the next day back and forth. Uh, Pasi Selberg, our colleague from Finland, has a good lecture on, on uh, how, how there should be less homework and more, uh, more learning, as he defines it. So I don't know the answer to that, but every one of these questions it should be on your agenda if it's important to you. But I would not start, as I said, with one factor and say, we better clean this up because it'll be too detached. You have to have as your driving force the uh, deeper learning, the collaboration to get there. And then within that driving force, you can begin to look at particular things. So uh, uh, anyway, there were, I'm sure you could find other places that have addressed the homework. You could just do the, the search and pra practice as we've seen. You keep seeing these articles come, that the do's and don'ts of homework. They're out there. You can look them, but you have to decide yourself whether they fit or not. Okay, let's have another one. Bonjour. Ma question est la suivante. Elle concerne l'inéquité entre les élèves. Est-ce que vous favorisez des groupes homogènes dans une école ou hétérogènes, c'est-à-dire des élèves qui sont classés selon leur force dans des écoles ou dans des programmes particuliers? Je rêve du jour où un jour on va peut-être évaluer en fonction de l'amélioration de chacun des élèves et non de leur intelligence. Maintenant, comment y arriver? Uh, so we, let's start with the goal. The goal, I said, was uh, reducing inequity on learning outcomes for all groups. No subgroup should be doing less well than any other subgroup. So the centerpiece of the goal is reducing inequity. And uh, it's also getting more serious because if you look at what's happening in society, that about... Uh, who's got money, who doesn't have money, who has housing, who doesn't have that. There's a trend that's with, uh, uh, just incredibly powerful where it, uh, there's growing inequity in almost every society. Growing inequity, and it's going fast. And when inequity gets too large, it starts to erode trust and social cohesion. And if you look at the surveys on uh, trust in countries, they show two things. They show some countries have greater trust uh, as, a, as a social measure than other countries. So the Scandinavian countries have greater trust. Probably Canada does. U.S. trust is down here. U.K. trust is way low. So trust is one indicator. But I think the, uh, the answer to your question is I favor heterogeneous groups, if, you wanted, if I had to do a forced dichotomy, because you, you want to show how uh, everyone can learn and that in lots of the heterogeneous groups we see older kids are helping younger kids, kids who, ha who have this. So you, uh, if you do a homogeneous group, you produce too much division for the subgroup. You have to have diversity. The same thing applies to adults. I wouldn't want a school that just had all teachers who wanted to do collaboration. And, and, that, and there, so we isolate them as a homogeneous group that wanted collaboration. Collaboration has to be for everybody. So you have to figure out every group and, and uh, build those in. The essence of what I'm saying is the ingredients that have to go into the solution. They're not a particular f five steps for each one, although we can do that in some ways. It's really uh, going for overall solutions. Okay, we have a couple more. Yep. Bonjour. Uh, yep. Nous sommes des passionnés. Alors, uh, quelquefois, le facteur temps peut jouer en notre faveur ou en notre défaveur. J'aimerais que vous nous parliez un peu du facteur temps, soit dans la durée d'implantation de la nouvelle culture ou du facteur temps qu'on se donne dans notre quotidien de travail pour y arriver. Um, yeah, so let's, let's take the time factor, as was said. Um, we used to have an observation that it takes three or four years to change a elementary school, six or so years to change a high school, uh, eight or nine years to change a district, and forever to change a university. So, because <laughs> we've been there. Uh, but I want, to, um, I want to now say 
that we have accelerated the timeline for success. And uh, this is uh, very clear in our work. I just showed you the one school from Anaheim that within 16 months, they changed the culture from mediocre to fantastic. So uh, the, think of it this way, is what you're doing now, is it satisfactory to you? That's my first question. Are you happy with the way things are? And if the answer is you're not happy, why would you keep on doing it? I don't have time to change, but I have time to do the wrong thing. <laughs> That's kind of what it feels like, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, you're not doing it on purpose, you're just stuck in inertia. So I'd say the first part is, how dissatisfied are you with the way things are? And if you're pretty dissatisfied, it's up to you to start changing in the direction that I'm talking about. Because then, and I, I do say, we are ex we've accelerated because we've involved teachers. We've accelerated because we've involved uh, students. We've accelerated because we involve parents in the partnership. All of those things that are the mobilizing others uh, from leadership from the middle accelerate change. And that it is getting faster. Uh, quality change that operates faster. So we, we will continue to document that, but there's no, um, there's no good reason not to open the door. You don't have to do everything the first day. We're talking about, remember, start slow to go fast. You start to build it, you get momentum, you get more people on board. There is no easy solution to this, but I can say that the status quo is going to kill us. Kill us with inequity and kill us with frustration and eventually calamity. So this is urgent. And it's not just to do with climate change, it includes that. It has to do with social change. Okay, do we have uh, one more? Tom. Bonjour. Est-ce qu'il existe des pays ou des écoles qui organisent des services en fonction des apprentissages des élèves plus qu'en fonction de leur âge physique? Uh, yeah, and I think, uh, I think Finland is one of those countries, but let, let's just stop here and I'll, I'll get to your question in a moment. Uh, about uh, two and a half years ago, Google, the education team in the U.S., asked me to do a blog they said, we've just uh, commissioned a study on Finland, and uh, we have it, it's completed, and we'd like you to read the research study and write a blog on what other countries can learn from Finland. And that was my assignment. So I read the, I read the research report, it was something that uh, I knew enough about Finland, it rang true, it was pretty good, et cetera. And then I titled my blog this, Find Your Own Finland. Don't go to Finland to find yourself. Go to yourself to find yourself. Your surroundings, your country, your culture. It doesn't mean you shouldn't borrow things, you should. But, uh, but the, you see where the, the essence is. On your question, in deep learning, there is a lot more heterogeneous cross-age learning. Just what they do. Because you, you, you don't need to change the whole structure in order to increase the degree of interaction. We have all kinds of schools, they, I'll go back to Ottawa Catholic, where grade, eight, grade seven students are working with grade three students. And uh, where heterogeneous students are working with each other. So there's nothing to stop you. In our model of changing the learning environment, leveraging digital, changing partnership, changing practice, it all is open to that possibility. And every time someone says, we can't do the X or Y in my, in my uh, school, we can find another school where they're actually doing X and Y in the same jurisdiction. So we've got to take some risk. If it's important to you, start, start making the changes. And you can make, even within the structure we have now with age group, you can make a lot of changes that free up homogeneous groups and create heterogeneous learning. Uh, same age as well as cross age. So no excuses not to do it. Okay, do we have uh, one more? We're sort of getting warmed up here. I'm gonna show another uh, short video, four minutes. And, uh, Again, think of your ABC, and this is, and also think about, in both of these videos, we featured students talking, talking the walk. You hardly see any teachers, a little bit, but it's mostly students who have become so activated about their own learning, they're able to describe it to themselves, to each other, and then cause more of it. We have several videos where teachers have the, are talking the walk, so it really is getting clear about this, so I'd like you to 
think about, stick with your letter A, B, or C, your two uh, C's that you were looking at, and see what you uh, interpret in this uh, clip. It's called Wurana. It's a school, again, in a different part of Australia. The first one you saw was in uh, uh, outside Melbourne. I think this is an, another part of the state. So uh, think about this and look at it as another example. I don't mean any of the examples as literal. I mean that they're part of the domain that we are now talking about and seeing. The Enigma mission came from the students' ideas. They wanted to be able to capture something that was slightly mysterious, something that grabbed your attention. I'm out going about my business and I'm going to find the answers. An Enigma mission is a project based on deep thinking and uh, basically you have to choose a topic and you have to research very, very deep on it and the more deep the better. Welcome to the Enigma portal. Your task as a member of an Enigma mission is to explain the great paradoxes, conundrums and mysteries of our existence. An Enigma mission is kind of like a passion project and something that the teachers will help challenge us to expand our knowledge of what happens around the world and what's in the real world out there. I chose um, autism as my topic because I have a relative that is autistic and at first I didn't know anything about autism and I was very interested in the topic. I chose to do my Enigma mission based on the thiocene, also known as the Tasmanian tiger. Miss Vine, our teacher, she said she would pick a few students to do this project about bone integration. And so we took up that challenge and we tried to do that. But uh, the main challenge for me was um, DNA. I was like so interested. I mean, learning from DNA, DNA is an Enigma mission in itself. I mean, it's not a question, it's a whole Enigma mission. I interviewed people and tried to find out their understanding of autism and I contacted a scientist. I had to research about the animal and the process of bringing it back to life. I also contacted a paleontologist named Michael Archer. Him and a group are um, trying to bring animals back to life. I'm not going to grow up to be a doctor, but I am going to grow up to be a computer engineer. So I don't know how genes can link with that, but with my genes I could like produce some sort of new like software or something. We want them to be thinkers, we want them to be people who can create change, people who can make a difference. This has changed my idea for what I want to be when I grow up and also I want to try and say to the world that not everyone's the same pretty much, that it's just because they have like different body parts and stuff like that, it doesn't mean they're any different from us. I think it's given me a whole new um, look of autism and I think it's um, shown me a lot um, of what it's about and I think I would like to be working on autism in the future and trying to help people with autism. Uh, debrief with the person beside you but you're thinking of these C's two at a time, uh, you're doing that. And I want to end with uh, saying how much of these ideas are coming bottom up. If you go to the description of Ottawa Catholic, just because we've researched it, uh, there are 83 schools in Ottawa Catholic District. They started in year one with seven. They paved the way for eight more to join in year two, so at 15. And then in year three, they had paved the way and the rest of the 83 joined. So by the end of 24 months, they had all 83 schools. And paving the way is important because they didn't just say it's going to be expanded. In fact, when you do change that's attractive, more people want to join earlier than you can handle. So this is how they do. But that's, that's one point. The second point is that, and the leaders will tell you this, almost all of the ideas they're working on came from the bottom. They enabled them. They, they, they opened it, but they didn't come in as leaders and say, we better do this plus this plus that. They made it possible for groups to define what are the next steps schools to do, to learn from each other, and the whole thing. And then they started to capture what was working and then feed it out and people wanted to do more of it. So this is very much a change in culture. 
And this is a change in culture that requires the mobilization of everybody uh, in that that participates and it has a chance to sort it out. And it, it also involves tapping into motivation. When I compared our work with uh, Dan Pink, who's a psychologist who wrote the book called Drive, where he talks about, uh, he did research on extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. He said intrinsic motivation, or extrinsic I should say, is when uh, it's carrots and sticks. It's when you're punished for the wrong thing and rewarded for the right thing. He said, we know that that doesn't work. It can work a little bit for a short period of time. It always fails because it's not internal. He said, if you shift to internal, and this is the research is again clear. Our research is clear. Internal, he said, and I, I was interested to see how it mapped on to our conclusions because it was almost identical. He said, uh, internal, uh, uh, intrinsic has following three things. We've added a fourth. First one, he said, is a uh, sense of purpose. These students that you see in scores are getting a sense of purpose that they never got by just learning literacy or by just doing something by the book or, tech or homework, whatever. They got it by being part of something that was worthwhile to them. So a sense of purpose was one. The second one, he said, was uh, mastery. We call it capacity building. If you get good at something, you want to do more of it, usually. If it's worthwhile, you get good at it, you do more of it. The third one he called uh, a degree of autonomy. That's the recognition that we've had that you can't be, it's not a group think proposition, and it's also not everybody on their own. In between that are the, uh, are the kind of uh, uh, degrees of autonomy that individuals have. And the fourth one that we've added, because it's uh, an intrinsic motivator for us, is connection with others to do something worthwhile. That's the, what to us is the humanity part. We have a uh, neuroscientist on our team, Jean Clinton. And uh, when I ask her about anything, I say, to what extent is something innate to uh, the human nature? And I ask her about being connected to others. So what is it, like when you're born, do you have something in your brain or in your genes that is innate to wanting to connect to other people? And she said, the research is clear. Unequivocally, it's there. If you have a bad life, it can drum it out of you. If you've never been, uh, if you've had a terrible life from day one, that's a different story. But if you really open up the opportunity, you get to this. So this should be the essence of education, tapping into home, a human and social motivation for the purposes that I'm describing here. It's really necessary that we start to do this on a bigger scale. That's what we're trying to do. I hope some of you will join us in this, and thank you very much for today.